And this is a guy who said, oh, we won't have an overflow crowd tonight. <laughs> uh, so um, if you have trouble hearing, let us know. We've got a, a mic that Brad is willing to use if that's an issue. Um, and um, a few weeks ago, Brad came to me and he said, you know, a lot of people have been asking me if I was going to do a program on the history of flooding in Lafarge. Can I do that here? And I said, of course. <laughs> so here we are tonight, and uh, I really appreciate Brad putting this program together for us. So, are you ready, Brad? I here am. we go. All right, thank you all for coming, and uh, I have nothing prepared. <laughs> I see a number of my former students in here, so you understand. <laughs> Um, except what's on the screen, so I'm just going to go from that. And a, a couple of things I wanted to present tonight was uh, in looking at the uh, history of flooding in Lafarge, which, you know, I wrote on not this summer, but the previous summer, and then we got a really bad flood in September, and I was blamed for it, <laughs> for writing those articles. So I was never going to write any more flood articles. Well, then we had, you know, the granddaddy of Mall in August, so then I started writing again, thinking I couldn't be blamed <laughs> in the past. Um, and I came across some kind of common themes. There are some specific floods, the larger ones basically, that we're going to cover tonight. Um, and some of the things that kind of remain the same uh, over 120 some years and other things that drastically change um, during that time uh, as well. So my lovely wife Carolyn is operating the <laughs> machinery there. Um, she'll be uh, pulling the combine up to the side of us. So if you want to hit the next one, dear. <laughs> the floods that we're going to be looking at are generally considered to be the biggest uh, um, floods in uh, the Kickapoo Valley. That, that is not to say that there weren't a lot more because as a kid growing up here in Lafarge, uh, I can remember where floods were a constant. Um, not, nothing like what we had in August, but I mean, it, it was just the, the way it was. And I think pretty much anybody growing up in the Kickapoo Valley would say the same thing in regards to that. I mean, the valley in itself is kind of prone to, to floods, but these are the, the ones that we're, we're gonna be taking a look at and, um, and as we go through, we'll note some similarities and differences in, in um, all of them. So let's start with that uh, 1899 flood. And one of the, thing, one of the things that uh, I really wanted to show you, to share with you tonight, were some of the photographs that we have. Because working on this history project, one of the things that I have accumulated over the years is some am amazing photographs of uh, not just floods but all kinds of things to do with our history and I wanted to share some of those with you. Now this is Sealy in 1899 and some of you know where that's at and that's uh, uh, in uh, northern Lafarge now and this is uh, basically <coughs> kind of up on the hill there across from the uh, OV uh, driveway looking down um, um, past uh, uh, Carmen Stout's new house uh, down into Sealyburg and this is a Charles Brown photograph. I was a marvelous photographer. Um, I've written about him several different times and uh, the Brown family was, uh, his family was from up the Star Valley and he had a studio in um, Sealyburg, a photography studio. Um, interestingly enough, by this time, in 1899, he's left uh, that studio and moved the business down to Lafarge here, um, mainly to get away from this kind of thing. But this is a this is really an interesting photo in that, and you can't quite see it, but you might be able to see. Notice there's some arrows back here showing where the river is. This is the river back here, and this is you know this is. 
Sillyburg Road, we call it today. And, you know, Sillyburg was a, was a community of several hundred people. It stretched from, from a Chapel Hill on the south end all the way up onto Norris Ridge, um, where the reserves uh, dam is today. And um, this was the, the flood in Sillyburg and um, there's we have several photos here um, this would be this lane right this is a, is a kind of a lane here between the fences this would run up uh, on to French Hill up there where Chuck and Gwen Hatfield live now but uh, used to be used to be French Hill uh, before it became Hatfield Hatfield Manor is it <laughs> you know what I want to say about the Hatfields you may have heard that they put in solar uh, power at their place, and uh, the sun hasn't come out since. <laughs> I'm just saying, right, Gwen? Yeah. We've saved a half a tree. <laughs> and I asked Chuck, a sapling? <laughs> there you go. All right, we have some more uh, brown photos of uh, this flood. now. Uh, this this is one, and this is an original um, photo that um, that uh, somebody gave me. And this is kind of looking from Cedarburg Road up um, toward uh, uh, Wintergreen Bluffs, if you know where those are, are over. And this is basically a new channel that the river has cut right from the corner up there. Earl Nelson says that every time there's a flood that the river wants to cut this channel, and it actually did during this flood. And if you look at the next picture, um, you can see that this is the new channel. Now this isn't the Kickapoo River. This is the new channel of the Kickapoo River after the 1899 flood. And you can see here some of the businesses along the river. This is. Uh, this is Dr. Carpenter's office and apothecary next door, and you can see it's all caved in. Uh, he would eventually um, uh, not rebuild here and, uh, and leave here as many of the other businesses too. But uh, again, this is not the channel of the river. This is the, the channel that was cut by this flood in 1899. And I think we have one more. No, we don't. Um, the re relocation away from the floodwaters. Relocation is one of the interesting things that plays out throughout all of these floods. Either doing it or not doing it, either being for doing it or being against doing it, it, it kind of depends on where you're at in our history as to what they think about it. But because there had been a number of floods on the Kickapoo in the 1890s, Sealyburg was relocating, and it was coming down here. It was coming to Lafarge, and um, it's interesting that we talked about Brown's photography before. Brown moved his uh, business down here in uh, the mid 1890s, uh, as did uh, uh, Millard General Store. Um, later, the Milliston Furniture Undertaking business moved down here. Starners moved their feed mill down here. Um, these these two here are after the 1899 flood. Methodist Church, which was originally at Chapel Hill, um, by 1902 had moved down to this corner over here, uh, very similar to where the church is uh, now. And all of these moved basically to higher ground along with a lot of the people who lived in Sealyburg along the river. They just got out of town and sought higher ground. And so you can really say that the, the flood of 1899 was the, was the end of Sealyburg. But while that was going on, large <coughs> where we're at down here, or uh, the James Corners or whatever you want to call it at the time, that's actually growing toward the river at the same time. Um, and that's because of the railroad. The railroad came to Lafarge in October of 1897, and so as businesses and um, other things started to develop along and near the railroad line, then businesses started going that way, and housing started going that, that way, so that when 
Lafarge being incorporated, ironically, just a couple of months after that great flood of 1899, uh, after their incorporation in that same year, they're starting a process where they're moving toward the river. So you have the people of Sealyburg getting away from the river. Uh, and by the way, they did in Reedstone as well. The 1899 flood uh, was devastating along the whole valley. And most of Reedstown at the time was located over where Reed's Creek comes into the Kickapoo. Kind of over, if you know where the Kickapoo Corners is there now, in that neck of the woods there. And that 1899 flood just devastated the region. And that's when Reedstown said, we got to get away from this river, and really went and developed their town square, <coughs> um, if you know where that is now, with the gazebo and everything up there you know, uh, quite a ways away from the river. That was done after the 1899 flood. So it's not just Cityburg that's moving away from the river, but um, others as well. But there's a tendency not to do that because most of these towns along the Kickapoo River are mill towns. And the mill is operated by water power. And you want to be as close to the mill as possible. The businesses that are associated with the mill want to be as close as possible. The people who work there want to be as close as possible. So um, there's a real hesitancy to, to leave that area by the river. So moving on, we come to the 1907 flood. And I have this one photo um, of Seelieberg in the 1907 flood. Now this would be if you're up on Chapel Hill looking north. And um, you can see that basically, and you, and you can't really see it too much here, but if you look, if you could, we could go down in Main Street here, and this would be Seelieberg Road today. If we could go and look there, you'd see most everything is already gone there. There are a few stores here. Sam Hook's store is, uh, is still there. Sam Green still has a store in in Sillyburg in 1907. Sam Green's a fascinating story and <laughs> you live in Sam Green's house. Um, but Sam Green, you know, lived down in the Lawton district and this is Samantha and she lives and you have your bed and breakfast down there in that place. And anyway when in the 1890s Sam Green built a couple of offices and stores on South State, State Street in the Farts, the road leading to Viola, and Phil, you're practicing law on one of them, and the other was a shoe store, uh, which Sam Green ran as a general store at the time when he came north. But while everybody else is coming to, is coming, coming from Sealyburg down to Lafarge, Sam Green closes his, or sells his general store in Lafarge and moves up here to Sealyburg. <laughs> For a little while, uh, th this was this was the end of it for him too. But but just look at the devastation there in Sealyburg, and so you understand why they got away from the river. But of course, Lafarge in that decade between 1899 and 1907 has moved toward the river, and this is why it's the uh, railroad line. And uh, this is um, looking south from about where the OV cheese factory is today. It wasn't there at that time, it hadn't been built yet, but this is about where we're at. Uh, heading down river here, you can see the river is um, washed out the railroad and all of that kind of stuff. And that was, a, that was a key part of the problem with the Kickapoo Railroad, was they built it right along the river. And so there was constant um, damages um, for that railroad uh, from the very beginning. And you'd almost thought when they got to Lafarge in 1899 and that flood hit, they might have said, whoa, let's get out of here, but uh, they kept it going and this is what it looked like. Uh, this is just south of the depot. The depot was right next to where Newsom's is today. And notice here, now these houses that you see here are all on Snow Street. And that's the one right below Main Street. And these houses, this one, and this one, we're also in the 2018 flood. This is where Virginia and Tony Billick live. Uh, they're a little higher now, yeah. <laughs> but still not quite high enough. And this is uh, Cindy Heading's house right here. Okay, all of these houses had been built by 
in that 10 year period between the 1899 and 1907 flood. And notice the, the town is heading toward the river. And, and this flood hits, and, and the previous uh, photo was by Potter, one of the, uh, Charles Brown left and went to Hollywood and became the, uh, became the uh, photographer of the, of the stars. And so we have, but we still have good photographers in town. And this is um, Strait, who's a great photographer too. And um, so this is the 1907 flood <coughs> on Snow Street um, that you see here. And the next one is a, a uh, classic scene, which we're going to see repeated a lot tonight. <coughs> and this is that view down Main Street. And this is... Um, very interesting because this is the local attorney, uh, Alva Drew, and his son, John, and their dog. Phil, do you know the dog's name? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, I don't want, want to question uh, lawyers, even though Lonnie had a lawyer's joke in the paper this week. I don't want to go there, but... Does this look like a place to be walking your son? <laughs> I don't know, I'm just saying. You know, Might have been looking for clients. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. Good event. I think this photo was taken on top of the, from the roof of the uh, Central Hotel, um, which is where the post office is now. And it's just a classic photo. I mean, this is where the co-op is now. Um, and uh, there's... Silver Street running up to school there. Um, this used to be called, Gary, wasn't that called the Beehive? Uh, that was a rooming house where a lot of people lived and they always had a lot of kids there so they always said it was it was always busy as a beehive there with all of the families and kids there. And, um, so, But you look down at the end, there is no Newsom yet at this time. They're, they're actually there but the, what we think of as Newsom's is not there at that time. But I mean, just look at some of the classics that we're going to be seeing over and over. We've got lumber in the middle of the road <laughs> spilling out of the lumber yards and things like that. And so in 1907, we see this water basically um, coming up to the co op zip stop area that we would think of today. So um, a long time ago, we had this kind of a flood. This is the flood that was always the greatest, up until the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and it did not just flood in um, Lafarge. I think Chuck, you might have given me this, Chuck Caffield. Um, and it just kind of shows the destruction in Ontario, and I was thinking of the destruction in the two towns today, but just look at this bridge. That's a bridge there. <laughs> Sideways? You got to kind of see it there. This is the top of the bridge right here. You know, that, that's that's worse than the picnic table on top of the highway side, <laughs> right? You know, but I mean, again, it shows you the widespread destruction in the valley at that particular time. Okay, so and what, and you know, these floods that we're covering aren't the only you know floods. I mean, here's here's a big flood in 1913. It doesn't even make the list. This is a springtime flood, probably snow melt off combined with maybe a heavy rainstorm, something like that. But uh, this is um, about where the uh, the uh, old cheese warehouse is, north of north of Main Street and the Lafarge. This is the old um, engine house of the railroad. This would be just north of the depot. Um, you know, down, this is down in the neck of the woods where the the uh, fairs are, or the markets are held in the summertime, just so you kind of place it there. But again, you know, huge amount of water there. And again, the photographer there is is Potter from Lafarge. And then we have the 35 flood. And speaking of photography, this is an aerial photograph, which we haven't had before in any of our photos. And this is the uh, photo that appeared on the front page of the Milwaukee Journal. And uh, this is Lafarge. And um, this is Newsom's right here. Cheese factory right here. Heading up Main Street here. Um, gives you an idea as to the railroad actually runs in 
right along here, you can kind of see it. You know, and there's a lot of businesses associated with the radio, at the, or with the, still with the railroad at that time. Notice the diagonal <coughs> line that runs across the village here. You know, the village is laid out on the grid, north-south, and this diagonal high water mark, which we're going to see in a lot of other pictures and in, in uh, floods over the years. And uh, it's interesting, and in, um, my, my, my cousin, uh, Trixie Larson, um, when she was alive, wrote books, and she wrote local history books on Bear Creek and, um, and the Steinmetz family, and her book on Bear Creek, very interesting. And um, she was kind of interested in these floods, especially on Bear Creek. And she had a letter, there was a letter in one of her books from George Steinmetz. And uh, George was a cousin of my dad's, and he was an engineer, and uh, ended up being um, a member of Governor Knowles' cabinet in the 1960s. He was the director of state uh, utilities uh, in Wisconsin, um, wrote on the Lafarge Dam Project both pros and cons, but he was talking to her, or writing a letter to her about the 1907 flood, that one we just saw, and he made a sketch of Lafarge, and he draw, he drew this high water mark right across the town, just about like this. So it, it was there. What's more significant about this photo is that it not only made the front page of the Milwaukee paper, and the entire front page of the Milwaukee journal was filled with flood stories about Lafarge and it continued all week um, as the, the reporter just moved down stream and wrote about Viola and Grove and all of those things is that this was picked up by the national media uh, basically wire services at the time and it became a story all over the country and this particular photo uh, appeared in other papers in other parts of the country. And so this Kickapoo flood was really a big deal. I mean, it, they were always a big deal for the Kickapoo Valley, but now it was a national story, which leads us to the Kickapoo Valley, after years of these floods, decides they're going to look for help. And the real reason they were looking for help was they were afraid they're going to lose the railroad. Because there had been a series of floods in the 19, early 1930s that had caused lots of damage to the railroad and there was talk when that 35 flood hit that they weren't going to do any more repairs. It was real concern that the, the, the valley was going to lose the railroad. So the village leaders and led by the village president here in Lafarge, Arch Davidson, um, needed help and where could we go to help and so they went to Washington DC which was preparing a water bill at the time which was going to include all kinds of um, flood control projects and they testified in Washington DC and it was included in the 1936 water bill the Kickapoo Valley was and so representatives from the Corps of Engineers and the Department of the Interior came out and they did studies of the Kickapoo Valley and met with people in Everett, all the towns and did all kinds of things and by 1940 they had come up with a plan which called for a uh, flood control dam to be built north of Lafarge and the original plan called for the, the bridge or the dam to be built up in the Rockton area, just north of Rockton, as a matter of fact. Not just north of Lafarge, but north of Rockton. And there would also be two levees built, one at the village of Soldiers Grove, one at Gaze Mills uh, downstream. So, you know, there was a structural approach to controlling the floods in the river. And um, this map is uh, one of the things that came out of that study, and I always love this map. It's Corps of Engineers map, uh, published in 1938. It shows the valley. Uh, it shows the watershed of the valley. And what I really like about this is that uh, we know today that the Kickapoo Valley is the only entirely self-contained river system within the 
driftless area. Which means this entire area was never altered by glaciation. Which means that this setup that you see right here is really, really old. And that this river is really, really old. And if Bernice Schroeder was here tonight, she'd tell you the Kickapoo is the oldest river in the world. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't get her buddies at the geology department in uh, <laughs> to go along with that. <laughs> but she still argued. And suffice to say, this is, this is one of the oldest river systems in, the, in North America, without a doubt, because it just never was glaciated. But, I mean, it's neat. That was all came about because of that study that was done back in the 1930s. Of course, we know that uh, that project wasn't started because of World War II and a variety of things. And so we move on and uh, we come to the 1951 flood. Now, it's interesting that the 51 flood was not a great flood here at Lafarge. But it was south of Lafarge. It was devastating, and mainly because the main rain events were virtually on a line east to west, just south of Lafarge, almost kind of right through Lafarge and down river. But it was devastating to the valley. It's, it's interesting, you can even break it down. South Bear Creek, for instance, was just devastated with this flood. North Bear Creek, which isn't that far away, not so much. So it just kind of depended on where you were at. But it was the record flood at Viola until this August. The highest water ever in Viola until this August. And it is still, look at this, it's still the highest recorded flood ever in um, Soldier's Grove. That, that, that kind of amazed me because I thought, you know, with this flood water here uh, that we had in August, I thought, you know, it's got to break all the records, and it did everywhere except Soldier's Grove. So it just shows you how huge this flood was downstream. What is also important about this flood is it puts the Kickapoo Valley back in the national limelight again. Because there was a story in Life Magazine. Remember getting Life Magazine when you were a kid? <coughs> Some of you aren't old enough. Um, or look. Um, because there was a story in Life magazine about this flood, and particularly it centered on Gaze Mills, which was devastated by the flood, and the heroic efforts of the um, uh, telephone operator down in Gaze Mills, who stayed at her post and called up everybody to warn them to get away from the river and get away from the water. And eventually she found out that she was sitting in water and uh, had to go upstairs and then she was rescued out of not the second story window but the attic above. Just to show you how scary that was. And they had a photo of it in this life story of her being pulled out of that, that attic uh, dormer. Um, and in a really neat story about that flood. So again, Kickapoo Valley's back in the national spotlight, which brought the dam project back into the spotlight, um, and it was started up again. Um, so now we, we skip to the 78 flood, and uh, this was the one that hit right as Lafarge was gonna crank up for the 4th of July, if you remember, and, and then you're looking down Main Street again, as this is like from in front of, uh, from uh, Cheryl's shop here. Here's Danny there, the bar operator, wondering how he's going to get people into his bar then. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a big band booked and nobody's going to be around, but actually everybody was around uh, for this. But again, the zip stop would have been up right in here, so you can see the water running through there. And, uh, here's the old bus garage and uh, some of that stuff from that 78 flood. And we got some other shots of that. I think Earl's in Florida, isn't he? Yes, he yes. is. Earl Nelson? Yeah. So this is, this is how Earl Nelson handles floods. <laughs> I asked Earl in uh, August, I said, how many of these have you done? How many floods have you been doing? Well, he says, I think it's been about 50 years now. I mean, it wasn't a flood every year, but 
He's been involved in a lot of these from his folks, of, and Joyce's sister has too. She's from the folks' garage up on Leicester uh, Creek, you know, to down here. And uh, so anyway, this was uh, a lighter moment in the, in the afternoon as, uh, as some of the equipment was being uh, hauled out of the uh, lower, lower part of town there. And I think we have some more, 78. <laughs> oh yeah, here's, here's a personal photo. This is looking down Snow Street. Okay, the motel would be on your right, Burt's Apartments on your left. <coughs> Carolyn and I lived in Burt's Apartments at the time. This is Brother Kent right here, he's sitting right back there. Uh, Toby Funnel, some other fireman I imagine. This is uh, Maxine Kennedy's house here. But again, you know, this is major flood water. Through here. Uh, I was out with Brent Waddell that morning. We are trying to figure out how we are going to run the 4th of July. We had a big tractor pull that day. And uh, the tractor pull eliminator was going to come down from Norwalk. Digging hearts. And so Brent called him up and said, uh, about the tractor pull. And the guy says, you know, I don't even have any idea where that eliminator is. It washed away in the flood last night. <laughs> so we knew that was off. <laughs> and we, and we all, and, but the water hadn't hit Lafarge yet, so we didn't know how bad it was going to be. But he said it's, it's the worst he'd ever seen. And pretty soon the messages started coming down from Ontario that it was, that it was going to be that way. And so Brad and Brent are down to the Newsom's, and we're over at the... Uh, at Jeffers helping put stuff away and it dawns on me that hey I live <laughs> right here <laughs> so I go running home and here's Carolyn running out with our little chihuahua under her arm and trying to get away from the flood and thanks for coming back <laughs> yeah. and of course we have a almost completed dam north of town. Yep. And uh, we have some canoeists going by the dam tower in this record flood. By the way, one of these idiots is Jim Moe from Gillsboro. <laughs> I always get on Jim about this. Um, yeah, they thought it'd be great to be going uh, canoeing on the Kickapoo this weekend. Didn't realize the water was quite as bad as it was, so... Anyway, so because of the dam project, which was supposed to have been completed actually a few years before this, the dam would have been completed, and they actually would have been backing up water here in, in uh, June, July of 78. Uh, but of course it wasn't completed. So anyway, because of the dam project, once again, the um, Kickapoo flooding became a national story. And um, to the tune of, in that fall, um, there was um, stories on the 78 Kickapoo flood on the CBS Evening News. Bob Faw came up from Chicago and um, talked with Lonnie and a bunch of other people and interviewed Bernice and Ward Rose and different ones about it. And they, he, they were just gonna put it on the Chicago uh, TV station. CBS station in Chicago. Thought it'd be an interesting story. But they had to send it off to New York for them to look at, which they did. And then New York said, by the way, that's going on the evening news. That's not going on your show. <laughs> and so the CBS evening news uh, with Roger Mudd um, featured, was shown on Friday the 13th, by the way. <laughs> Is that ironic? Um, uh, featured this story which was called The Great Kickapoo Loggerhead. Great piece. Um, you can, and you can find that if you go to a place. Charles Osgood. You know Charles Osgood worked for CBS News for years. Um, had a Saturday radio show called The Osgood File. Wrote a poem about the flood. And CNN News, which was kind of new. You know, they were just kind of starting out. And they sent a couple of people out here in crews and put together a real nice story, which intensified the sentiment about why haven't they completed this dam, you know, which would help with this flood control. And so we went back to years of hearings, studies, 
political hand wringing. I wrote about all this before, so I won't get into that. Um, but in the end, after another about 30 years, there was from this dam project, there was never anything that was completed. We're supposed to be five um, retention dams built north of the valley, north of this dam on Rush Creek and different ones up that way, and that was never done. This dam was never completed, so never actually happened. But to show you, talk about relocation again, look what Soldiers Grove does. After that 78 flood, which just devastated their downtown. Remember, we went down to Soldiers Grove to view the damage there, and they had a relatively new bank building. Yeah. If you remember, made out of uh, brick. Mm -hmm. And it had caught the corner of that building and just ripped it off. And there was a, the, the, the vault, the outside of the vault was visible, you know, because the, the building had just been ripped, ripped apart. And it was just unbelievable how bad the, uh, the damage had been there. So Soldiers Grove said, we're not going to wait any longer for our levy that's part of the Lafarge Dam Project. We are going to relocate. And of course they teamed it with solar power, became the first solar village, and in the late 70s, early 80s, were moving their entire downtown district out of um, the floodplain and up on the hill. So again, relocation after this flood in Soldiers Grove was um, accomplished. So then, moving along, I want to buy you out. And um, so you had um, extensive development of that. And the village itself um, decided to move the fire department, the ambulance squad, and the police to a new EMS building. That came about because of the really the 08 flood. And finally, even Gaze Mills undertook um, a major relocation uh, effort to higher ground, and this is when they decided that they were going to build up on the hill and put in a municipal center up there and a, and a business center and and uh, open up places for houses and apartments and all of that kind of thing. That was all came about and lots of relocation that we're looking at now um, in 2008 after, what, just a hundred years of these floods. <laughs> And here's our, here's our new EMS building, um, which uh, is, um, Steve Donovan was president of the village at the time and really fought hard for this. And, and um, you know, we were kind of working together. I was still at start chair at the time and at one time we were going to have the, the um, Lafarge and Stark municipal parts, uh, garages with this as well, but uh, couldn't get any grant money for that. So. That came about. That's relocation. And uh, the Highland Street Apartments right across the street over here, they were built because of this flood. Um, we're replacing, we're trying to put places in the village where people uh, weren't going to live. Look at this, 19 houses were located outside of the floodplain. Uh, 14 after the 08 flood and another 5 after 2010. And that doesn't include the loss of the Burt apartment building which burnt down just a couple of days after the uh, 2008 floodwaters subsided and was a direct result of the flood. So there was three more housing units that were gone besides those other 19. And then we, we talked about uh, Virginia and Tony Billick's place. Two houses on Snow Street were elevated um, to get hopefully out of the floodwaters. Um, with this DNR funding. So we're seeing um, some changes here as, as the relocation is, is, is taking place. And then we have another series of floods culminating in the great flood of uh, last August, but remember that we also had floods in 16 and 17. And this is the bridge down at Wallace's the Wallace place, um, south of town, an old, old bridge had been there forever, it was barely hanging on, and 
I can remember it was after the 2008 flood. We had a major clean out effort to make sure we could get the flood trash away from this bridge. And uh, the water was too great, the flood trash was too great, and the bridge went down in this 2016 flood. And we had another flood in 2017. Beautiful photo. I love this sunset. Here, you know. uh, but again, you know, what do we? You know, same kind of thing. The water is not as high as uh, 2018, of course. But you know, it's up here, close to the to the zip stop, and uh, and uh, kind of surrounding the Majors Building where Utopia is now, uh, to kind of show there. And uh, and I also have another picture of uh, this is south of town. You know, and it is kind of interesting because m many of the houses and and that are gone here, including yours <laughs> from the 2008 flood. You you've lived through this. Um, many of the houses here are gone, but still people say, "Well, that was a really bad flood in 2017." Well, compare that to what we had in August. <laughs> it's 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 hardly comparable. But I mean, here's Bear Creek coming across. You know, it's filled up down below, it can't get into the river, so it chooses another course to, to go across here. So, you know, they're, they're there. This was a, this was a, a September flood. That's what it was. So, um, so now we come to the greatest flood ever recorded, which was in the flood in August, of, um, late August, early September. Um, over three and a half feet higher than the 2008 flood. Just to show you how high that is, there's a flood gauge up, up in the exhibit hall at the reserve. You familiar with that? Sure. You know, and they keep putting these flood... <laughs> so they were... They got up there with the 2008. And uh, so they decided they would put this one on. Didn't have enough room on. They've got it right stuck up on the ceiling, but it's not quite accurate. And Marcy says they're not going to raise the <laughs> <laughs> But we we're redoing that exhibit, so it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But again, just major damages to houses, businesses, farms, crops. This has been playing out for 120 years. Streets, roads, bridges. You know. And we don't quite know where we're going to go now with what what uh, happens from the 20, 2018 flood, um, you know, and here in Lafarge we probably have fewer questions or looking for answers to questions than say Viola or Ontario does, because they're both really considering about what are they going to do with their main streets. And we are somewhat in this town, but we have some higher ground that some of those other places don't have. So then, you know, what lies in the future? Uh, again, here's, here's the, the 2018 flood at the zip stop. And by the way, good pictures of the 2018 flood are in the zip stop. And Ronnie was going to be here tonight. I don't, Ronnie come? No. Ronnie Appleman took great photos of the flood downtown there in this area and they're on display in the zip stop stop in and see those so they're great um, to show the devastation and this is you see these clouds right here this is really before the bad stuff hits but look what we got down here here's our iconic scene for Lafarge you know We've got the Red Angus bull on the bridge up to <laughs> up to Coon Valley, and we've got the picnic table stuck on top of the sign up in Ontario. And here in Lafarge, we've got an old railroad storage shed used to sit on the other side of Newsom's there, right in the middle of Main Street, bobbing along. I guess there's some video that kind of shows it, Bobby. That'd be good. So, and so hey, here's here's our 2018 flood. Again, Blake Herkin and his drone photo. You get great stuff with with Blake's camera. And again, here's that. Notice this. We've got another view of this diagonal. Notice that going on across there. It's interesting though. Notice the difference in the zip stop in the motel here yeah. from 2018 to 2008 it's it's remarkable how much more water is there and i and this is not the highest point 
It's still not up into the driveway next to the the, uh, the post office there, which it did that night. So, but I mean, it, it shows you how bad. And here's our little shed. Yeah. <laughs> Earl's trying to rent the shed out, except he doesn't have a key to open the door. <laughs> Just what he told me. He isn't here, is he? No. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick. I'm gonna stick with that story. Though. Yeah. Okay. So another one of the 2018 flood. Again, the zip stops. Yeah, this is this is uh, it's pretty scary looking. And again, you know, normally it does not get into this building, does not get into the motel. When it's three and a half feet higher, it does. Yeah. And so, Charles Osgood wrote a poem called "The Kick Boo." In 1978, had it on his radio show. Well. We should tell you that, which everyone in the Kickapoo knows, they still have the floods. Oh, they have lots of those. He wrote that in 78, remember. <laughs> still fits. Uh, 30, 40 years later. And then from Bob Foss' CBS news piece, the great Kickapoo loggerhead, an unfinished dam stops no water. <laughs> and our last slide, uh, here's the 2018 flood, and there is the dam tower. But I'm not going to go there. We're not going to talk about the dam tower. That's for another time. So, I think, is that concluded, That's Carol? The last yes. Slide, yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Other <laughs> questions? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Still kind of new to the area. I was wondering if you could speak to land use through the ages and how that affected it. Uh, it has a great effect. Um, if you look at the, the um, emergence of flooding in the 1890s, it can really be tied to the entire logging off of all of the um, pine plantations north of Lafarge. And it, 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 kind of a a unique ecosystem, um, almost like the uh, pine forests of northern Wisconsin, um, extended down to this area. And um, starting um, shortly after the Civil War, they started logging all of those off. And by the late 1880s, 1890s, most of the trees were gone, and most of the land was being cleared for farming, which again took away all the cover. And so the water races to the river, and the river can't handle it. So um, I'm not, and it's, it's obvious there were floods in the Kickapoo Valley before settlement, but um, they became uh, almost a constant after um, settlement. But it's interesting that uh, with the reserve and less farming and trees growing back and all of that kind of thing, it hasn't stopped the flooding. Although the weather situations, the, the events that have caused the flooding have changed a little bit. But, yeah. Other questions? Yes? Brad, before, when Sea the Bird started to disband mm -hmm. and they moved, and Lafarge was right before they were incorporated, do they each have their own political entities? Um, um, Sealyburg was not incorporated. They were not incorporated. So they so were... They didn't have a mayor or anything. Well, Dempster Sealy ran the show. <laughs> <laughs> he was a mill, op he was a mill, mill operator. Okay. And so they were parts of the town of Stark um, okay. at, at that particular time. Yes, they, they both were. And, so, and when, when Lafarge was incorporated, shortly after the flood pictures you saw, um, Sealyburg became part of Lafarge, although they hung on for years. You know, you, go, you look at the old Lafarge Enterprises, and there were Sealyburg News in the paper. It was a Lafarge paper, but they had to have Sealyburg News. So everybody realized it was still, still going to be there. So, yeah. Yes? Do you know anything about, like, how the floods 
um, create damage based on where the rain falls. Like if uh, there's a big patch that happens over Ontario with Lafarge and Viola versus it's all up north coming down the river or both. Is there any kind of information about that? And what, what do you expect to happen if that kind of thing happens? Well, um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, that um, is interesting in the 2017 flood was not, it, was, it flooded here in Lafarge, but it wasn't that great. Whereas downriver in Grove and Gaze Mills, it was catastrophic. The 2017 flood was. And that's because it was the West Branch and Southern Vernon County and Northern Crawford County that took most of the rain. So it, it really does depend upon where the rain comes from. But when you get an 8 or 10 inch uh, rainfall, like you had in um, Cashton, Westby, um, Ontario, Wilton, that whole area, it just dumps it all. And, you know, we didn't have that much down here, but we were getting that water, and then we got that five inches of rain that next afternoon, which just blew everything off the charts. And it's, it's eerie how often that happens, because in the 78 flood, there was a night of almost constant rain that got that flood going, and then the next day, wouldn't you know it, we got another three or four inches, which just blew it off the charts. And that often happens with those. But a lot does depend on where the water comes down. For example, that is, um, there's a Finney Fun Land, which is my brother-in-law's, this time of the time. And what really matters to them, in addition to the Ontario water, is Bear Creek and Hunter Creek. Because Bear Creek and Hunter Creek come together just south of the farm. And so what happens there has a greater impact to them than what could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as, I mean, that's only an instance. Each one of the cricks is the same situation. So yeah. it just depends on what little valley gets hit. Yeah. Yeah. And that 51 flood is a pretty good example yeah. of that. It was like um, Camp Creek, is, I mean, Carolyn's family tells stories about that, that flood on Camp Creek because they lived there at the time. And, and uh, you know, cows stuck in the tops of trees and stuff like that. And, uh, but up here, it wasn't that way. So it just really does depend on where you're at. Other questions? That, uh, yes. Stock you took of um, from Chapel Hill down the old Sealyburg Road. Is it Garnet and John Stout's house there on the corner still an original building that was in? Uh, yeah, that house is the oldest house in Lafarge, mm -hmm. built in 1865. Yeah. But that was part of Sealyburg. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. that's like the last house of Sealyburg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, up the, up what they call the lane, the Lawton houses, are th those aren't the original houses, but those are um, part of that too. So, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Sorry. Just one more comment. <laughs> Is the, um, interestingly enough, old 131, which, if you've been up there when they opened it up, when we were growing up, you know, Brad and I and so on, that flood so much more than between Lafarge and Rockton now. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't take much water for us to get flood days. For <laughs> <laughs> and so all these other people were celebrating, and that's very selfish. <laughs> we were kids. We're kids. And so we'd get out for snow, we'd get out for floods, we'd get out for all kinds of stuff. So. <laughs> we, would, we would have flood days because Gary couldn't get down. Yeah, the that's right. He couldn't get the bus to Gary's, <laughs> <laughs> Gary's house or, or up to Joyce's on Easter Crick or all of those places. So, yeah. That color 51 was really hard on Easter Crick, too. Yeah. It was a bad one. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? <laughs> And the Lombarge Fire Department came up and, with their fire truck and washed out our garage. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They've done that many a time and many a place <laughs> over the years. Okay, yes. Yes, sir. I, I just want to make a comment about, you know, my mom grew up in West Lima, the highest point in Richland County. There you go. I know a ridge dweller. And so they go out and they look at the floods for entertainment, right? <laughs> yeah. so we, my mom told me about 1935, she was on her dad's shoulders, and they went out on a ridge 
and she saw a haystack floating down the river. Mm -hmm. In 1951, it rained and rained all night, and she opened up the door to their basement in their house and in West Lima, and it was full of water to the top step. Mm -hmm. She just closed the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 1978, we all got into our station wagon, and we went somewhere, probably around the valley, and looked at the floodwaters. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Now that is that's really interesting. I want to tell you that the you talk about stories like that, and, and yours is unique because of your family and and those memories. But um, they are going to they're working on a project to get people's stories from the floods here in Vernon County this year. The Driftless Writing Center is putting it together. They're trying to get some grant money and do an oral history project so they can get everybody's stories, which I think are, are very important um, to get because of all of the different um, things that happen to people and, and all of the different things that people will, will have to share with. So you remember those things. And being a historian, I, I, you know, we have our photos, but those stories are, are really valuable. Are most of the, have most of the floods been not necessarily with the spring thaw, but other times of year? Yeah, the, there, there are virtually none of these that are spring thaw floods. They're almost all combinations of things, and generally when I was writing those columns in summer of 2017, one of the things that I found is that they, you can almost go back, and Matt Gabrielson has helped me with this, and his knowledge of weather and being able to get to records and things like that, and um, you can always go back and find heavy snowfalls followed by a, a really wet spring, lots of rain in the spring, boom. We have a big rain event in the summer and the water levels are really high. And By the way, folks, the water tables are really high right now. I mean, it's just, it's just scary how much water is still standing around and everything, all the creeks and rivers are running high. And there's water running on the ridges that never runs. I hate to even say that. <laughs> we went out for a road inspection in, um, in the spring of 2008. Lonnie, you probably remember this. And Myra, we were up on the ridge somewhere. And Myron Richard said, I had never seen water running here. It was running down this ditch, you know. He said, you know, he, he's lived in the area his whole life. He said, I have never seen water running. It was just running down. It wasn't. A, from a rain or anything, it was just running. And a few months later, we had the greatest flood in record. So that's the kinds of things that you kind of have to have these kinds of great floods. Yeah. Okay, we've got all kinds of treats out here, so help yourself to treats. If, if you'd uh, be interested in getting a book, I can autograph them for you over here. Or... Great job, Brad. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.